our brother when they call David Odai, he don't cry, come out to, he don't come raise alarm, talk, say, President Tinubu, they threaten him. See, if anything happened to Ram, may they all President Tinubu responsible, my people. Una remember what happened to Mubad. Now, so he tell the start to, Una remember, say, this guy, say, he don't put mad for Tinubu matter, not be here. Now, in the good is Zolim, in Ladia, in the good is Zolim, information Ladia. They put out for net, we be say, people, they come, they see, in a true, not true. All the dot now, this guy, now they connect them together. So, for me, I believe say Tinubu not like can ka 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 ka. So that's why it tell the Ghanaian president make him repatriate him back to Nigeria. Because Tinubu no say if if he bring him back to Nigeria, he go deal with this guy. He go regret deal with my bona con After life. this one, constant bolo for we call the year say President Tinubu. Hey, for the speech we go make for US, he can't talk say we need you to come back home. They tell the Nigerians where they America. Where they do Bodo Yibo, where all the basic amenities they work, where the people they live good life. He say, We need you to come back home. Forget the frustration under our former leader. Tinibu tells Nigeria in the US, My brother. This one not be win. As this one comes to Bolo for our con the year, say the a papa lami the gang. Con tepita obise. He not go ever get the party ticket in 2027. Make it a run, my people. Now, wow, 2027. With am I mean one on now? We never get air for year when they talk of 2027. See, the news we can they fly some few hours ago. Can they hear say Shei Tinubu Tinubu son? He can't give 15 million donation to. Mobad Peking, my people, people they carry fake news. Sha. That is why, and there are some news that you're seeing and say, No, there's no need. You know, if they chase class with pest where they say, Don't die, they carry this to the essay. She can't come out, come debunk and say, I bear go. He not donate any 15 million, but Nigerians waiting now too much. Waiting. And this one, I can't lead us to the news of say the police don't conclude the autopsy. For the lay singer Mobad body. Now remember, I said they go exhume the body, come and they come to say they see blood for inside the coffee. People come, they carry some fake news. They go say Mobad not die. In fact, he never died. They put her for inside ground like that. They bury him. The guy was struggling to come and my people, more than the toffee, they talk. Ah uh ah, -uh. he body one decay. Wait till they happen. Blood go for the command. All those blood will remain. We know if pump again. No, they command. All those things will come. They don't feel the but inside the body, you know, we they decay first now nah, before the outside the they decay. In fact, there are some things we be saying naturally. Una go see ya. first of all, research at least more. get the knowledge of say why una go see blood when they assume the body command. Men, celebrities, artists, in fact, anybody you can think of, just think of the news that this is matter. In fact, they follow police back to back when they not change the result up to see, like make the no say. Now the real result now they give them because they won't really see what can happen to this guy. This is not just Nigeria alone, no. All over the world, go reach you heads. In fact, they put a guy picture for their big boards, like big one. See, eh? oh, this guy eh? was meant to be a star before they just snatched his life. Looking at this whole thing, eh? nevertheless, this is the celebration you give to a star. It not passed like this. In fact, justice for Mubad just came all of a sudden from nowhere justice for Mubad. That is why Nigerian celebrities are following this news back to back. You see everywhere it has well affected a lot of channels because everything is just justice for Mubad. And that is why they, they follow this police up and down. One makes sure they don't change the autopsy result. It's really important. So my people ah ah so it's not cause the of wow. Now comparing this twelve year old at the bola with a commodity intesta and more bad story. You will see I'm saying Nigerian people just get away with things. You know, remember this video where we say go viral where they can't talk say they come out the Peking intestine from hospital, they don't know who do them. I, I I don't understand. The, the hospital not get CCTV camera. I be waiting happen. We be saying nothing trace or come out the intestine right now. They say the Peking don't die. The child is dead because person will not get intestine. Ah, he want to feed. Ah, he want to survive. It's not possible now. We are the nutrients. We are the nutrients want to work for your body. 
my people, this life is really wicked, though. Very, very wicked. I promise you, this case, what, what I don't die down. In fact, they don't bury and nobody go know it will happen. Nobody go over here with it will happen. Nobody come and come to say justice for Adebola. May they look or may they go search for how that intestine thing means. All of a sudden, intestine means they can't trace it and the picking can die just like that. My people, this one are the same country. We bola made Tinubu go they talk rubbish for US, make the Nigerians where they they made they come back home. I am not sure say our president understand waiting talk. No, I'm not sure. Lastly, for this news, before I give you the main video, hmm, our president don't para, he don't vet for article. He say why article they dig inappropriate information they come at. Hmm. You know, bless me, you the reader, I'm make a reader as a bio. He say article digging inappropriately into Tinibu's record. We are not sure what the motivation is. President lawyer tells U.S. courts. It's very simple. The motivation is that he want to pull Bola Tinubu down because they are playing a game of chess. You know, say nobody they want to give up when they play that game. So I think one win, Tinubu one show a pepe. More they watch you, it's on a correct film. See, eh, this one, eh, they say Tinubu don't run quick, quick. As your years say, the school one release every document, give article. The next thing they say, it go. Emergency appeal. Emma, they say if you see the way Tini put it wrong, eh? all the lawyers, you know, are big, big, big. All the other run at a skater. They go, they appeal immediately. Me, they stop the eh, document from being given to article. Wait till now they hide. My correct, correct person will be ODTV, but we will analyze all the trends with the app. Don't forget to share, subscribe, and like the video. I beg, na area, na do it. My name is David Dane. I'm an investigative journalist from Nigeria and I'm constrained to send out this public appeal to the Ghanaian government, to Ghanaian President Anaku Fado, the Ghanaian Minister of the Interior, Honorable Ambrose Derry, and to the chair of the Ghana Refugee Board, Prof. Kenneth Atafua. Um, I fled Nigeria in 2020 and um, I applied for asylum in Ghana in early 2021. Um, in May 2022, I was granted um, refugee status in Ghana. Um, consequently, I was also issued a Ghanaian refugee travel document, a refugee passport, which I have subsequently used extensively to travel across Africa and around the world. Now, um, last month, when um, there was the ongoing um, back and forth between uh, those who wanted to go to war uh, within the ECOWAS bloc, those who wanted to go to war with the, um, the coup regime in Niger, and those who didn't, um, something happened. Um, the Nigerian president, uh, Bola Ahmed Tinubu, um, made a move to deploy Nigerian special forces illegally um, into Nigerian territory to enforce a no-fly zone, which is a euphemism for essentially staging a military attack, an unprovoked military attack against an independent sovereign nation and a friendly country to Nigeria. Um, as, as was expected, most people um, in the Nigerian government, in the Nigerian military, and in the citizenry at large weren't at all on board with this. But Mr. Atunambu was clearly desperate to start this war with Niger, a war that nobody wanted. Subsequently, a secret document was leaked to me, a document which contained um, basically um, attack instructions and uh, uh, basically um, staging um, plans for this illegal invasion of Niger. And I knew that by putting this document out, I could potentially stop a catastrophic invasion which would lead to an immense and unnecessary loss of West African life. So that's exactly what I did. Um, early August, um, I put out this document. And um, it had the desired effect. It did, in fact, stop the invasion. Um, subsequently, Mr. Tinubu then tried to seek um, uh, permission from Nigeria's Senate to deploy the Nigerian military into Niger. The, the, the Senate knocked this back. Um, and to all intents and purposes, um, the invasion essentially 
um, became a stillbirth, right? It didn't happen. Which, from the point of view of, I think, any right-thinking person in the ECOWAS sub-region was definitely a good outcome, right? It, what definitely under no circumstances should have happened should have been a military invasion of Niger by Nigeria, leading to an outcome that no one would have been better off. Well, I could spend an hour explaining the many different ways that this would have been a terrible idea, but I'm sure most people know this just as well as I do. It would have been something that would have been catastrophic and would have benefited nobody except probably Mr. Timbo himself. Now, after I leaked this document, I, I was made aware um, from several sources that the Nigerian military establishment and the Nigerian um, intelligence establishment um, be became essentially um, particularly um, enraged with me. So I've been a person of interest for a long time, but um, with that, I became um, designated as something of um, an enemy of state. And um, as my, you know, as fortune or luck, bad luck would have it, um, just a month before this happened, uh, the fact that I in, I do travel with a Ghanaian passport, that I have a Ghanaian passport and I travel with it, um, had become exposed to the public through no fault of my own. Um, following a, a very unfortunate event in Zimbabwe, after which the permanent secretary at the Zimbabwean Ministry of Information, uh, probably thinking that he was scoring a point against some sort of um, uh, foreign journalist, you know, following their issues with foreign journalists, decided to tweet to a global audience the fact that um, I, I did claim asylum in Ghana and that I, I travel with the Ghanaian travel document. As a result of this, the Nigerian um, establishment knew who to speak to if they um, wanted to get a hold of me. They were aware that I had claimed asylum in Ghana and that I used a yeah. Ghanaian uh, travel document. So I was informed that a, um, a Nigerian intelligence agency, I'm not sure whether it was the National Intelligence Agency or the Defense Intelligence Agency, but one of these um, foreign intelligence um, uh, institutions dispatched a jet to Accra to um, basically have me illegally rendered to Nigeria. Uh, apparently, they sent, they wrote a letter to the Ghanaian government accusing me of um, apparently aiding terrorism by supposedly um, revealing the locations of soldiers. And apparently, um, I was also guilty of treason, whatever that means. Now, um, it seemed as if the matter was going to end there. But uh, more recently, I've come to find out that the, the Tinubu government is still trying very hard to um, to enact some sort of um, illegal rendition. So the latest tactic apparently is to lean on the Ghanaian government um, and accuse me of having apparently sabotaged an ECOWAS mission and in, in, in so doing um, basically uh, compromised the block security of the ECOWAS region, in which case Ghana being itself an ECOWAS member is then obligated to um, cancel my asylum, to revoke my refugee status, and to and to revoke my Ghanaian passport. Um, the Nigerian government's hope is that in revoking my passport, um, whatever travel privileges or visa or residency privileges I enjoy anywhere in the world will be um, will be compromised. And as a result, um, um, it will then be more possible for them using the various avenues that are available to obviously a nation state to um, to have somebody extradited or to have somebody illegally rendered. In this case, a journalist who fled the country because of his work and claimed political asylum in another country and gained full refugee status. Um, but the Nigerian government obviously has no problem trying to flout international law in this way. Now, um, the reason I'm making this appeal publicly to the Ghanaian government and to the individuals I mentioned at the outset is because I'm aware that even though um, the Ghanaian government, as I mentioned, has a you know very, relatively great track record when it comes to obeying international law and um, not um, not behaving obnoxiously 
in the international space, which was why I chose to clean asylum in Ghana in the first place, I'm also aware that there is an, there's a limit to which Ghana might be able to resist the cajoling or the bullying of Nigeria, which obviously um, exerts a lot of influence over the Ghanaian government. So um, I thought it would be prudent to put this out there. Um, I know that the, Ghan the Nigerian government um, is trying to do all of this in secret, which is why you know, I was only able to obtain this information, you know, through you know a fashion, right? This isn't information that is out there, but I'm putting it out there on purpose, uh, hoping that it makes some kind of a difference, because um, at the end of the day, um, I do believe that um, just the same way as you know Ghana had every opportunity to. Uh, to give me up in the first place. When I came to asylum in Ghana, there was every opportunity to use me as a diplomatic bargaining chip with Nigeria if it wanted to. But I know that Ghana is not that kind of country. I know that the Ghanaian government um, historically has a lot of respect for international law. The Ghanaian government historically has a very strong um, Pan-Africanist outlook. And the Ghanaian government generally tends to um, lend itself to being a, um, a safe haven for people who are fleeing political persecution um, from wherever they are in West Africa, in Africa, and in the world at large. There's a, there's a very good reason why um, even during my time in the safe house in Accra, there were, there were quite a number of, you know, journalists and, you know, whistleblowers who, who were in similar situations who were also spending time in Accra. They weren't even just from West Africa or even from Africa. There were people from Europe there as well. That's the kind of stellar reputation that Ghana has when it comes to being a, a safe haven and, you know, a, 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 an oasis of stability in what is generally still a very unstable area. So I want to urge the Ghanaian president, uh, President Nana Kufa Addo, the Ghanaian interior minister, the, the chairman of the Ghana Refugee Board, um, the Ghanaian Immigration Services, you know, all of whom are apparently being linked on by the Nigerian government to consider not only obviously the fact that um, I have been obviously granted full refugee status in Ghana and the, Ghana, the Nigerian government is trying to make Ghana blood guilty, right? The Nigerian government is trying to get Ghana to break international law so as to find a way to have me return to Nigeria. And the entire purpose of having me return to Nigeria is to even a personal score because the person who is Apparently, the president of Nigeria now, as I'm sure everyone is aware, has a personal bone to pick with me because I am the journalist who is responsible for essentially destroying whatever false reputation he was trying to build in the international space. I am the journalist who revealed that Bola Ahmed Tinubu is a drug trafficker and is a certificate forger, both of which are about to have a significant impact on his continued um, stay in office. Um, this is an attempt to settle a grudge um, using a sovereign country, which is Ghana, as a sort of blunt force tool to get at one individual. This is the kind of the exact kind of behavior that the Nigerian state was renowned for during the 80s and the 90s under the military era. And at that time, um, some of these very people who are in power now, including the supposed president in power right now, did actually... Um, find some sort of refuge, safe refuge and haven in Ghana, right? And I'm sure the Ghanaian um, intelligence agencies, the Ghanaian security services, the Ghanaian immigration services obviously have records of all of these. Um, Ghana has a very, um, a long and storied relationship with Nigeria in so many ways, you know, uh, specifically when it comes to um, serving as a safe haven for um, people fleeing political persecution in Nigeria. Without the support and um, hospitality of, of Ghana and of the Ghanaian government, a lot of the work I've been able to accomplish over the past few years could never have been done. Um, I might not even be, be, be alive. Right? The Ghanaian government has been nothing but um, honorable in its dealing. So I want to urge the Ghanaian president to resist the temptation to allow an illegitimate Nigerian president to push Ghana into breaking international law. Um, 
I obviously don't need to mention that there is a law called the law of refoulement, which um, forbids the um, the um, illegal repatriation of political refugees back to the country that they fled from, where they are going to face you know persecution. It's very well known that if, for whatever reason, I were to be returned to Nigeria, I would not survive it. This is not a secret. So I'm putting this appeal out there publicly. I, I wasn't going to do this initially, but um, seeing as it doesn't, uh, it doesn't look like there are that many options left, and um, the fact of my use of a Ghanaian passport and my permanent residency in Ghana is going to be used. Uh, or is the Nigerian government is trying to weaponize that and you know Ghana for all its best efforts for all its best intentions might not be able to resist the bullying of the Nigerian government I'm constrained to put this message out in the public domain at the very least for record purposes so um, if anything were to happen to me I hope it doesn't happen but if something were to happen to me um, everyone should know who is responsible for it and under what circumstances um, these things happened um, the Ghanaian government, as I, as I said, has been nothing but good to me. The Ghanaian government has behaved excellently, historically and presently. Um, I hope that continues. Um, I, I, I hope it's able to resist the, um, the tactics of the, the Nigerian intelligence agencies, uh, the, the NIA, the DIA, the DSS, you know, all, you know, which are part of the erstwhile, um, the infamous NSO, um, security organization. Um, which used to carry out this exact sort of um, in, uh, illegal international activity back in the 80s, because um, apparently that's that's the era that we've gone back to now. Um, but in the event that it does, in the event that the Ghanaian government isn't able to um, to uh, hold Nigeria off, and my Ghanaian passport is is revoked, my my Ghanaian permanent residency is revoked, um, I'm also appealing to. Um, international institutions that may be watching this to um, lean on, you know, whoever can be lent on to um, see that this um, reaches some sort of resolution. And in the event that there is no resolution and um, I end up becoming um, a journalist who ends up dead because I did my job, well, I want everyone to know who was responsible. So that's that's why I'm putting out this appeal. Um, I hope the Ghanaian government does the right thing. Um, I have faith in them. They've They've, they've always done the right thing more often than not. Um, you know, there are so many m more people like myself who have found a safe refuge and a home in Ghana. It will, I think it would be a very sad thing if, um, that reputation that, you know, this country has built for itself should be, um, should be damaged because of, you know, uh, an illegitimate president in Nigeria who is uh, essentially trying to personalize the um, apparatus of state and use it to pursue his personal vendetta around the world. So um, that's all I have well, to say. Well, INEC has a case to answer. 165,000 ballot papers, not stamped, not signed, and not dated. This is a big problem. It's INEC it's, that we it's a, it, it's a really big problem. I mean, I guess the case will definitely go to appeal and then the Supreme Court, you know, the police has called for calm. But I wanted to read um, the governor's uh, statement, which he posted on X last night. Well, he wrote, my good people of Kano State, you would recall that on March 18th, 2023, you came out en masse and voted for me as your governor with a total vote of 1,019,602 and a margin of 128,897 votes between my humble self and second place. Subsequently, I was duly sworn in as your elected governor on May 29, 2023. You may also recall that the party that lost the election took us to court. However, after almost six months of proceedings at the governorship election petition tribunal today, Wednesday, September 20th, that was yesterday, the judges of the tribunal have in their own wisdom delivered their ruling. As human beings, their judgment may not be absolutely perfect. There were errors and misapplication of the law as pointed out by our legal team. That is why our constitution provides for other stages to go on with such as the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court. 
On this note, we have already instructed our legal team to appeal this judgment as soon as possible to ensure that justice is done. I therefore call on all the good people of Kano State to be calm and remain law abiding. People should not take the law into their hands and security agents have already been directed to ensure the full protection of lives and property of innocent citizens across the state. We want to assure you that this will neither dampen our spirit nor slow us down as this is a temporary setback for our state, which we will overcome by the grace of Almighty Allah. Alhamdulillah, thank you all. I mean, I think that this uh, uh, post on X was very uh, uh, reassuring yes. for the peace supporters. Who are, they actually trooped out. I mean, I saw some videos uh, yesterday, the Kwan Kwan Sia movement, those yeah. with the red hats. I don't know if we have that video. They came out to the tribunal. I mean, a lot of people have said that this all boils down to INEC. I have another tweet, which I'll read in a bit. I'd like your comment quickly on this before I go to that tweet. Yes, absolutely, OG. It's um, INEC. I, I believe that INEC is culpable in a number of these um, outcomes at mm -hmm. the tribunal, especially when it involves the election of duties. Mm -hmm. And we had um, we had a spokesperson of NNPP here earlier today, Mr. Ladbiko Johnson, who had spoken about the fact that um, you know INEC had signed off, they announced the results, and now the court is ruling that some of these ballot papers were not stamped. How can a you know an electoral body charged with conducting elections have so many flaws in the processes? from pre-election matters to post-election matters, making it almost a waste of time yes. for Nigerians who stood on the queue to obtain their PVCs and then where, you know, the, um, different weather conditions stayed out to vote for their candidates. Mm -hmm. Having emerged, then we find out due to technical reasons, the election is nullified. This it, it's is heartbreaking for a number of people. Technical reasons, Rufai, I saw your post on, uh, was it Instagram or Twitter? I'm not sure. Festus Okoye, where he was delivering that speech saying there was going to be, you know, the use of beavers and that the electronic transmission of results were mandatory. I mean, I may drop the ball here. This is completely unacceptable. If this is true, not one, not two, 165,000 votes, those um, um, polling unit officers did not sign if this is true. Unacceptable. I mean, it's quite sad. Only to the fact that we spent billions, yes. close to a billion dollars, if not at the rate then, about a billion dollars for this election. And this was what we got. Massive level of incompetence that INEC has not been able to come out to account for. All the judgments across board, INEC has not been able to come out to account for its massive level of incompetence. Yes. But with INEC, that's why we should go back to the OAS report. Because a lot of reforms need to be done. Mm -hmm. The first one, the president must not be the one to select who is going to be INEC chief. We must go the way the OAS report wanted it, mm -hmm. where you have an independent panel that can look through it and different representatives across board. Secondly, mm -hmm. INEC must be rejigged. We need a lot of reforms that need to go into INEC. If we are going to have a separate commission mm -hmm. for election, election offenses, let us have it. Right. We need to make our election system, our election diary accountable. Thirdly, we need to go back to the National Assembly and be able to codify those guidelines that INEC, that the discrepancy now is, oh, the, the, the guidelines are not laws. We need to codify those guidelines because when you look at it, those guidelines explain how those laws should be implemented. Yes. So we need to go back. So we can talk all we want and call out INEC. INEC already has their, their, their neck under the sand in shame now. But it's time for us to go back and be able to fix all of this. Because this election was supposed to be one that will herald us into a new dispensation where you use technology. But with the beavers I necked outed and many vote rigging vaccines, nothing worked. It even looks as though the elections in 2015, when we first had the use of card reader, it's even way better than this because the elections, the litigation level was very low. In fact, one of the lowest in recent times. Yeah. As regards to this case, if I was the first presidential election that the loser did not challenge the winner, President Jonathan did not even bother challenging because there was a, a certain level of transparency as regards to that process. Right. 
Uh, people are asking questions. Let me read one from uh, Dr. Yakubu on Twitter. Uh, he wrote, I have these honest questions regarding today's Kano judgment. I need only honest and objective answer. I understand that the tribunal has ordered the inspection of the used ballot papers and they found that 165K ballot papers across the state were either not signed, stamped, dated, or both, which made them wasted. One, statistically, under normal circumstance, it is not possible that all those ballot papers belong to a particular candidate. Two, where were the party agents at the polling unit ward level and local government level when the votes were inserted? Who inserted them? Three, assuming 165K votes were deducted from NNPP, it will remain about 863K votes from them, while APC had 890K votes. However, the election had more than 70K votes cancelled due to overvoting, more than the difference between the votes scored by the two parties, 27K. Why wasn't it declared as inconclusive? I mean, I feel like this um, particular judgment might also just set a precedent, 165K uh, well, boots. you know, the uh, victory of the APC Guba candidate is coming as the United States Court in Eastern Illinois ordered the Chicago State University to release the academic records of President Bola Ahmed Tinubu to the presidential candidate of the People's Democratic Party. Atiku Abubakar, a U.S. magistrate judge, gave the ruling on Tuesday, ordering the university to produce all relevant and non-privileged documents to Atiku within two days. On August 2nd, Atiku filed an application requesting from the university the academic documents of President Bola Ahmed Tinubu. Atiku is challenging the authenticity of the Chicago State University diploma Tinubu presented to the INEC before the election. The former vice president argued that, among other things, a second Chicago State University diploma has since emerged, dated June 27, 1979, that bears the name Bola Ahmed Tinbu, but also presents with a different font, punctuation, seal, and signatures than the June 22, 1979 diploma, among other alleged discrepancies. I, uh, we did discuss, I mean, Dr. Bati, you read out this uh, statement right before we closed. We didn't have a, a, a time to discuss it, but I don't think there is much to say on this topic other than the fact that, you know, I believe that Tinubu's um, counsel had said yeah. that, you know, the, it was a, a clerical error yeah. that caused that, those punctuations and for the certificates to be different. And if you recall, on September 8th, the Chicago State University had responded to Atiku, saying that Tinubu attended the Chicago State University. Yeah. The only thing that they could not uh, verify was the authenticity of his <laughs> diploma because they consider it a ceremonial yeah. document. So, I mean, I don't know what's going to come out of this you know, report. They have confirmed that he did go to the school. Yes. We just need to know, I mean, what the records say at the end of the day and to be sure that it is really a clerical error that cost those discrepancies on his certificate. Yes, well, that's what we're trying to find mm -hmm. out. And um, correct me if I'm wrong, yes. Dr. Bati, with regards to new evidence presented at the Supreme Court mm. and what the, what the understanding had been in mm. terms of if they were extenuating and it was um, persuasive enough for mm. the Supreme Court justices to consider it as part of the election matters. You know, yeah. um, Atik Obubaka has been quite dogged in yeah. his determination to ensure that the, he uncovers this whole certificate um, debacle that has been been on since 1999. Right. And now Judge Jeffrey Gilbert has ruled that within two days they have to release the documents. Yes. Um, Chicago State University had said that they were unwilling, you know, or they didn't think it was important or instrumental or mm. key to the um, you know, petition or the evidence for the petition at the, you know, in the first leg of the petitions. And so they thought it was they felt it wasn't necessary to dis um, to disclose any further information. But now they've been compelled by the courts and they'll have to obey and we will see if indeed it was a clerical error. In Innocent, or there are two certificates presented, and then we have a case of perjury. Did you want to answer oh, no, question? Yeah, about the admittance? Okay, look, yeah, well, well. I could spend five minutes on this. You know, there is something in international civil litigation called forum. So, will the forum apply here? Can the finding in a, in a foreign court can it apply within our own uh, environment? So, these are some of the issues that that will come up. But 
what they, quickly, what the job giver was saying is that the discovery is for use. Mm. So that question is in relation to that. And that the person who has brought the matter is an interested person. But can what is discovered in that foreign court, can they apply in a foreign jurisdiction? That's number one. Number two, the uh, Supreme Court, the APS Court, is not a court of evidence. It's the APS Court, it's a policy court. So you don't go there and bring fresh evidence that you have not pleaded mm. in the uh, lower court. However, except you can prove exceptional circumstances. But the Supreme Court itself will have to accept those exceptional circumstances. And of course, that will cause a lot of argument on, on this, or you know, uh, in, in, you know, if that comes up. But the issue will be the relevance mm. of that evidence. Two, the weight of it. Three, can it be admissible? And the questions will be, okay, why did you, why did the appellant not bring these issues up at the lower court? And then why is this material to the case? Will it, in any case, result in the miscarriage of justice? So these are some of the, uh, these are some of the issues that could uh, come up, but it's up to the apex court to, to determine. And that's why I think the people have been jubilating. Ah, we, are, we, are, we have caught him. We have caught him. <laughs> discovery. Do they even know? Do they even know what will be discovered? Right. Because the issue is about the discovery. Right. Okay. So, what if it's of no probative value? Mm. That's the word. If right. it's of no probative value, it will be of no moment. Mm. So that's why everybody should calm down and not, you know, generate any foul play or begin to be sentimental and all of that. So nothing is already on the table yet. It yeah. may well be of no moment. All right, 30 seconds. I mean, uh, see, the fact that this is even a matter of contention is how shocking things mm -hmm. have gone in Nigeria. If somebody wants to leave Nigeria, he should be able to get his document out there and the school should be able to provide the document. Yeah, through a subpoena, now the court has been able to say they should give it to Atikwa Abubakar. It should be no big deal. Mm -hmm. So, but the fact that this has raised brohaha as regards you know, the background of somebody that is leading Nigeria, it is a big indication that we need to go out and look at ourselves once again in the mirror. This information is not supposed to be anything that is supposed to be of any big deal mm -hmm. that you want to authenticate and verify information and documents, you know, about someone that is leading a country like Nigeria. So we'll wait for it to come out and People will see people analyze either ways. We don't know what's in the document and all of that. Let's just see how this pans out. Yeah.